Good morning. Very nice to be back at the forum. I'll see a few familiar faces, um, despite the glare. Um, so we're here to talk about the future of work. Uh, it's a big topic. We're going to try and keep it as um, uh, focused and relevant as possible on how that plays out in the context of uh, our global cities. Um, so work has always shaped these cities, uh, from the skylines to the people in them. Uh, if there's one thing that brings us to a place like Chicago, it is, it is opportunity. Um, but we know that work is changing in many ways. Technology, uh, from email to our Amazon deliveries, makes it easier to work from anywhere than before. We don't need to be downtown in the way that we used to. Um, we have new generations coming through with very different expectations. Um, raised in the gig economy, told they're going to have 10 to 20 jobs in their lifetime, and uh, wondering whether they'll ever be allowed to retire. Um, we have the recognition that our old ways of working have excluded many, uh, women and minorities not least. Um, we have forecasts that a huge influx of people from rural areas to global cities uh, is going to transform them yet further. Um, you know, if the UN is right that um, the world's 69% of the world's population will be living in cities by 2050, up from 55% now, we have to find jobs for those people somewhere. Um, and we have a new wave of technology, um, AI to automation, which is going to reshape work once again. So uh, th that can be very threatening to work. The, in one of the latest reports I read from Bain talks about 2.5 million jobs a year in the US alone being upended by automation and AI. Um, and that's 25% 25 25 of the workforce by 2030 may be having to find something totally different to do. Um, but uh, it's important to find something uplifting for these events. So I did go looking for a quote, um, and I found a good one. Um, automation can be the ally of our prosperity if we will just look ahead, if we will understand what is to come, and if we will set our course wisely after planning for the future. That was LBJ in 1964. So we have been thinking about this problem for quite a long time, uh, and I'm keen to um, uh, try and bring that up to date a bit. We've been worrying for a long time. Uh, it is undoubtedly a big challenge. It's an economic challenge. It's a technical challenge. Um, it's a challenge to our social fabrics in many ways. It's even a national security challenge. Um, so uh, we have a fantastic panel um, to address that channel, challenge. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce, if I may, uh, to my left, uh, Secretary Penny Pritzker, uh, former Commerce Secretary, founder and chair of PSP Partners, who has addressed these um, subjects as an entrepreneur, as a civic leader in government, uh, and as a philanthropist. Um, to her left, Anne-Marie Amaphidon from London, who um, got her master's uh, from Oxford in uh, mathematics and computer science at the age of 20, which I mentioned not just because you can't have two British people in a room for more than five minutes without finding where they went to school together, um, but because she's taken that, uh, um, that experience um, after a career with um, employee, uh, employers like Goldman Sachs and Deutsche Bank um, to try and get more um, girls and women into science, technology, engineering, and math uh, under the brand of STEMET which we'll hear more about. Um, to her left, uh, Kate Gibo is uh, Executive Vice President of Human Resources and Labor Relations, uh, United Airlines, here in, uh, here in Chicago, um, who leads a team of 500 people who are thinking about um, the culture of the company as well as the day-to-day -day challenges that HR and labor relations throw up. Um, and finally, Steve Adler, um, Mayor of Austin, Texas, since 2015. Must be one of the most enviable uh, uh, jobs to have. Um, background in civil rights law and um, a record of attracting an awful lot of people to um, that rather fun city. Um, so I'm looking forward to this. The, we know the robots are coming. Um, until they storm the stage, the intelligence will be all natural. Um, so let me throw this open first of all to Secretary Pritzker. Um, you uh, co-chaired a report recently um, called The Work Ahead uh, by the Council of Foreign Relations. And in reading about that, I saw you describe this challenge as the economic issue of our time. Mm -hmm. Why do you see it in that way? Um, 
Well, first of all, if you think about the seismic forces of automation, artificial intelligence, globalization, and the effect that they're having on people, it's, there's an enormous amount of angst out there, and people do not feel, and Americans, that we're, our report was focused mostly on Americans, uh, or solely on America, is people do not feel that the path for them is clear. How do they adjust? How do I adapt? How do I thrive in a situation where artificial intelligence and automation are norms within your community, your work life? There's an enormous amount of fear. 75% of Americans have a fear about their future work and that of their family members. So I, you know, the report that we produced is really focused on how do you improve the link between uh, education, workforce training, and jobs, as opposed to the two uh, sitting separately. And I would say we learned a lot from the folks in Europe. Right. Uh, there's a lot better uh, capabilities in countries like Germany, you know, uh, Switzerland, and others in terms of how do we do this than the way the United States has kind of let every man for himself or every woman for himself. And so the report, and you may ask yourself, why would the Council on Foreign Relations want to create such a, a report? It was really because the fundamental belief that the ability to lift um, people out of poverty and create inclusive economic growth is really one of our greatest foreign policy tools. Hmm. It's not just something that's a solution uh, for our own economic growth, but it's also a foreign policy tool. And so the report basically talks about the need for a fundamental systems change. Um, how do we better link education to jobs? and workforce training to jobs, and how do we really create a system that supports lifelong learning? And I can go into a lot of the specifics, we, but I'll we let will. you um, go. Okay, so, so here's the Council of Foreign Relations, Relations casting this as a very broad global challenge. And yes. we do talk a lot when we talk about AI, when we write about these, these subjects in the FT, we talk about the battle between the US and China, who's gonna win. We don't often talk about the battle between Chicago and Austin, but so, how does it play out at a city level when we talk about these challenges? Well, I think that the, the, the challenge for, for cities in terms of jobs is, is going to be one and has been one for, 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 for all time uh, for populations. Uh, Austin is a, is a fast-growing metropolitan area, the fastest-growing metropolitan area, large city in the country for each of the last seven years. We have uh, over 100 people moving in, in every day. So, so the jobs uh, in our city is, is something that's both uh, attracting people uh, as well as uh, uh, creating challenges for the, for, the, for the community that we have. Uh, in, in our city, uh, we were able to attract jobs, we were able to attract people primarily because it's, a, it's a, I think, a magical place to live. Uh, people want to live uh, in the city. Uh, it's a beautiful city, it's an entrepreneurial, creative city. Uh, it has the University of Texas, so there are a lot of, of attributes in the city that attract people to, to come there. Uh, and I think that's the primary reason that Apple and Facebook and the other companies come there, because the people that they want to have work for them want to live in a city like Austin. But with that many people coming, uh, and with those jobs coming, it creates challenges. Foremost among those are, are affordability issues. Uh, we're finding that it's harder and harder for the people that are in Austin yep. uh, to be able to afford to, to, to stay in the, in the city. It creates stresses on infrastructure like mobility, uh, so we have those challenges. Uh, but, but the answer for us is, is not to stop growing or to not have jobs. Uh, the question we have is how do we manage the, 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 the challenges that, that come with those. So, um, Kate, you're the voice of business uh, on, uh, on this panel. Um, there's a, an old saying that governments don't create jobs, uh, business do, uh, businesses do. Uh, do cities create jobs? I mean, from, from your perspective at United, what role has Chicago played in this? So it's got to be a partnership between the business community and um, the political communities. Because you, we need the infrastructure in order to make it a livable city that uh, our people want to live in. And we're um, 
all over the United States. We have um, 150 people in Austin. We have 4,000 people that we moved from Elk Grove Village, one of the suburbs, to downtown Chicago precisely because we wanted the talent that we could get from downtown Chicago, and our people wanted to live here. Um, Chicago, one of the things Chicago does, I'm gonna pitch Chicago here for a second, one of the things Chicago does really well is it's got a very vibrant downtown community, but its infrastructure around allows a different, um, a different lifestyle. If you wanna live in the suburbs, it's easy to get in, in and out. And so depending on where you are with your lifestyle, you can do that. Um, the, the colleges here are great, the educational systems, so it really provides a uh, great infrastructure, which is important for businesses. And we, we, we coordinate a lot with the city um, on bringing in other companies, because the more Chicago grows, the better we can be, uh, and it's better for our employees. So that relationship is really important. Okay, so um, Amory, I think we probably all agree on this panel, the future of work has to look uh, uh, more diverse than the past has looked. Um, when you set out to, to found STEM apps, what was the, the problem, how do you identify that problem, and how have you chosen to address it? So, <clears throat> I started STEMET five years ago, um, and in terms of identifying the problem, uh, not much has changed since then. Um, so, we, we have this thing, uh, at least in the UK, and I know you have it out here as well, that almost every two weeks there's a new report out by someone somewhere, whether it's, you know, part of the government or uh, a company itself or a think tank or, the, you know, the education uh, system that bemoans the, the lack of, in mm. particular, girls and young women um, studying on that STEM pathway um, or participating in STEAM uh, role, STEM, STEAM, kind of, you like to use interchangeably. Um, and so it was something that I actually heard while I was at a conference here in the States at, at the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing um, mm. and heard that it was a US problem and got back and realized that we had the same, kind of from looking from the outside, the problem looked the same. Um, and actually, you know, were there things that we could learn from here in the States and be able to apply back in the UK? But what else could we do that was kind of culturally sensitive? Uh, because it, it, for at least you know, in the Western world, it's not necessarily purely a problem of access to that education and, and to those skills, but it's of, with girls in particular, the desire and understanding right. that it's something that um, they can do, they should be doing, they'll enjoy doing, and that it also allows them to kind of feed into whatever their personal ambitions or drivers might be. Um, and we, d we don't often enough you know, show the altruistic side of what's involved, but also the creative side. Um, and that's meant that, you know, on looking kind of at, at you know, technology and, and the march of the robots and a lot of what we're seeing in terms of warning, you know, if you had different types of people, if you had a lot of people contributing, it doesn't always have to be doom and gloom and losing jobs. And, and to be clear, how have you worked with cities in rolling this out? So uh, we work with cities. Cities are fantastic places because a lot of people live in cities. Um, so we work with um, businesses and uh, local uh, community groups as well as schools to bring the girls into those te technical environments to meet the role models um, and to actually get hands-on with elements of technology, elements of engineering, um, and see that it's something for them and, and allow them to have that extra STEM confidence mm. in themselves. Um, but then cities are also fantastic because there's a lot of opportunity in cities. Um, so, you know, having those companies means that you do have apprenticeships, you do have internships, you do have follow-on activities that the girls are able to participate in. Um, and within cities, that model works incredibly. Right. So, um, Mayor Adler, back to Austin, are the jobs of the, futures, the future just tech jobs? You, you, know, you run, you, know, you have a host South by Southwest every year. You've got some great tech employee, employers in Austin already. You're on the short list of 20 uh, cities that um, Amazon's looking at for its second headquarters. Is that the pure focus if you're the mayor uh, right now is pulling in tech jobs because we know that's the future? The answer to that is no. The answer to that is no. You're allowed to sing as well if you really? prefer. Um, <laughs> We'll send everyone home. Uh, you know, the, the, the jobs that we're looking for uh, in our city certainly include those tech jobs. Uh, but the most recent uh, regional comprehensive workforce development plan that we pulled together uh, identified three different uh, verticals. One was obviously the, the, tech, the tech jobs, uh, but also healthcare delivery. 
uh, in, a, in a city like Austin, you have challenges associated with uh, uh, access to opportunity, where large parts of the city are doing incredibly well. Uh, but the divide between those that are doing well and those that are not are exacerbating. So there are a lot of jobs, uh, a lot of jobs for nurses uh, uh, and that kind of support. And then certainly in a city like Austin, uh, skilled labor jobs, uh, real important. Uh, someone that goes through and, and gets a, a certificate in welding in our city right now makes a six-figure income. Uh, so, so there's a, a wide range of jobs. But those are the three areas that we're focusing on. Secretary Prisker, in your report, how did you identify the balance of different kinds of jobs that we're going to need to generate and focus on? Yeah, the report focused is on, on, let me give you a little bit of a framework on the jobs that are being created. And one of the challenges we have across the country, Austin may be a bit different, but it's true across the country, most new jobs being created, net new jobs, are contract jobs or gig economy jobs. Yeah. And the challenge that's being faced by individuals in those jobs is how do they, first of all, do those jobs pay sufficiently enough so that someone can support themselves or a family? Uh, and in our report, we call for relooking at the earned income tax credit, which we hate the name, but really it, we need to support making sure that jobs pay. But the second is benefits. Most importantly, our benefit system is really focused around jobs and structured around jobs, full-time jobs. But that's not where the job creation is occurring. And more and more businesses have said that their jobs that they will create will be contract jobs or gig jobs. And so how do I earn retirement benefits, sick uh, leave, uh, you know, uh, health care benefits, et cetera. It becomes really, really important. How do you earn, you know, the ability to take a vacation or be able to afford that in that environment? We have 55 million Americans whose primary source of income is either a contract job or gig jobs. So it's a very significant issue for our country, the quality of the jobs. Then the second issue is really one about how do we prepare the population for the transformation of jobs, and how do you really incorporate lifelong learning into our society? How do you fund that? Yep. What's the burden borne by the government? What's the burden borne by companies? How do we have greater data transparency so that we can prepare so the mayor knows, here are the jobs that I've got, so that the educational system can be preparing our populations for those jobs? So that the, there are a couple of big subjects there, but the, on this benefits point, um, I think the report talks about the need for a different approach to a safety net, to allow people, if you're going to move 20 times in your career, um, there are going to be periods where you're between, uh, uh, between jobs where you may not have health care, et cetera. Does that mean in this vision of the future that more of the benefits burden falls <coughs> on the city uh, or the state or the, or the nation? Well, one way or another, the cities are bearing the burden of that, right? If right. you have an unemployed population because someone's transitioning, because their industry is declining and another industry is rising. I'll take a neighbor of Austin. Houston <coughs> had that. When the oil and gas prices dropped so dramatically, um, they had a number, significant number of unemployed oil and gas workers. What do you do? Well, the petrochemical industry was thriving. And so the city came together, and, what do we, and that's one of the issues that we ought to be focused on is what does it mean to come together? The partnerships that need to be created to address these challenges require the business community, the educational institutions, starting K-12 community colleges and universities, but also our social safety net providers. And what Houston did was it said, we've got this need and we've got this big unemployment coming out of oil and gas and a need in the petrochemical industry. And they created a program specifically to retrain almost, uh, I think, 15,000 uh, oil and gas workers, but also needed to create uh, training for 75,000 construction workers needed in the petrochemical right. industry. That kind of, but that, to do that, you have to have the data. You have to understand. We're just, we have to make this a lot more transparent. The, um, uh, so this, this issue of education and, and lifelong training, um, uh, Amory, you're working with girls as young as five all the way up to 
to 21. So you're seeing this um, just as, yeah, before people come into the workforce even. What is your assessment of how well the education system in a place like Britain is preparing uh, this cohort of, of young women for the future of work? I mean, you, how much do you work with the education system? How much do you have to work around it? Um, so I, I say this, um I guess you always say, you know, I don't, don't want to cause offence, and then you, you go ahead and say something uh, slightly offensive. But I, I think the education system is doing as best as it can, given how quickly things are changing. Um, and there's almost this question of, you know, what, what purpose should it be serving? Is it genuinely to, you know, to create people that will go into these jobs, or is it to further the mind, or is it to, you know, to enlighten people um, and not necessarily be just for economic uh, purposes, right? We don't want to just train people up to be coders so they can work in all the tech companies and then, you know, things change. Um, so for us, um, we're, we're trying to complement what is available within the education system. Um, and we have had to work outside of it. Um, it it's, it's an interesting one because it's not purely about, you know, the academic subjects. It's not just about necessarily having that STEM knowledge or, or the English knowledge or, you know, any of the other um, subject, it's also about the person, it's about, you know, things like grit or, you know, their ability to understand how they learn right. or resilience and, you know, all those kinds of things that we tend to call soft skills, but actually are, are life skills. Um, and the education system isn't always best place to, to teach those things. Um, uh, uh, even, uh, you know, and uh, given that you know, sometimes the education system also struggles to teach the subjects it should be teaching. Um, so in the UK, we recently had the entire computer science curriculum revamped and brought in a new curriculum that started from the age of five, um, which was fantastic because, you know, we were no, no longer teaching floppy disks in the, you know, 2010s in schools. Uh, but the, there was then a kind of follow-on problem, which was that you didn't have enough teachers to then right. teach. Yeah. Um, which, you know, you, you solved one problem and, and created a couple others. So... For us, it's, it's quite important to work with the education system, um, but do that knowing and understanding that um, it's not just about formal education. You know, there's a, there's a lot more places that people can be learning and should be learning, and how do you give them the right kind of environments uh, for those kind of extracurricular spaces to learn, um, or just for awareness of yep. what is, is going on. Um, yes, I'd like yeah. to bring you in on that. I think business has a real responsibility here as well to um, not only partner with organizations like the STEM Ed's and cities too. Um, and just yesterday I was in Washington Dulles, we were launching a program working with a community college there to bring awareness to about 20 community college students about what their careers could be in aviation. And that could be anything from you know, IT to Homeland Security to architecture, all those things happen within aviation but these kids don't necessarily know that it translates directly to education. So we at United have that responsibility and we're doing that in each of our hubs. Um, also with disadvantaged, um, some of the disadvantaged areas within Chicago, working with different groups to get that pipeline of talent to introduce uh, different um, constituencies to what is the potential that's out there. So I think business plays a big role with partnering um, and creating opportunities um, in this instance. I couldn't agree more. The business needs to lead. Business ultimately owns uh, so much of the information as to where the jobs are and where they're coming, right. where, where um, the opportunity is going. And that's a really important uh, transformation, I think, that's taken place in many cities, is the business community is really stepping up and saying, no, no, we have to be much more in the center of that conversation. Uh, uh, and, and I also agree with you that it's, it, it, it takes partnerships to ultimately address these challenges. How much control do you have over education in a city like Austin? How much can you shape uh, the training that we're giving children as they come into the workforce? I think that, uh, that local communities have a, have a big control over education, and in, in Texas we have independent school districts with elected school boards that reflect that, but the partnership is obviously real important. Governments can help with the awareness issue. We can, we can help communicate the message to, to all parts of our community 
we can convene and bring together uh, uh, folks to be able to do that. But what we cannot do is offer the internships or the apprenticeships, or we can, we can, we can help bring people to the pipeline, but only if the pipeline is something that has been opened up uh, in, the, in the business community. Uh, the, the Regional Workforce Development Plan that I mentioned just a second ago was a product not of government, but government working with the community college, working with the employers uh, and businesses in the city. Everyone has their, their, their role, but the, 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 the key component for us in Austin are employers and businesses that are willing to open up their doors, that will recognize that, that, that the old ways, the old pipelines to fill positions are not necessarily the only ones or even the, the, the best ones, and that there's a universe of people that can step into those roles if they are aware of them and if they've received some measure of training, uh, most often insight. The, the, the best way to train someone for a job is to bring them into that job. So it's not an academic question at community college where they're placed. Uh, and I think governments would help underwrite the cost associated with that uh, if those doors were open. I think we're, we're seeing that quite a lot in the UK with the uh, university technical colleges, yeah. um, which is the name might suggest, you know, that it's in partnership with the universities, but actually it's industry, local industry in that city, backing a particular college and having students come through, working through qualifications that are related to that company with a view to them, you know, then joining formal apprenticeship programs or equivalent graduate programs. Um, so we're seeing that a fair amount and it, and it does work for cities. Um, where you do have the industry. I think my concern is more, sometimes there's almost too much of a bias towards that one particular company or towards that one type of business. Um, and then you then have students missing out on, you know, being able to see the full diversity of what's available. Isn't that, isn't that the danger, Secretary yeah, Britzker? You absolutely. end up with piecemeal. And well, one of the challenges that, we, that you face is if you looked at it from the student standpoint or the person in the mid-career standpoint, so, that we have, we see, saw across the country a scarcity of career advising. How do I find that pathway? I'm that seventh grader, I'm that 10th grader, I'm wherever I'm at in my education. How do I actually figure out how to get from where I am to where I want to be? I'd like to be a cybersecurity expert or I want to be somebody in machine learning. How do I do it? There's been a um, underinvestment in advising. There have been, though, the creation of some really interesting new tools, like Credential Engine, that is online, helps you understand the value of a specific credential, or Journeys, which is an online tool that you type in and say, I'm a ninth grader, and I you know, want to become uh, just like Anne-Marie, I want to become a technological expert. It'll help you navigate within Austin or within your personal community. What are the courses? What are the schools? How do you get from where you are to where you want to be? We need not only online, we need more of that in the schools because one of the challenges in the schools is we have college advisors, but we don't have career advisors. That's a very good point. Uh, so how do you handle this mid-career advice and training in a company That's like That's a United. separate issue. So one thing, if we were talking about um, our, our interns coming in, one of the beautiful things is we have a very senior workforce um, at United, and then we bring in these, um, these young students, and we're also introducing a lot of technology. Uh, you know, the way that you check in with the plane, um, right now you, have, you all have mobile boarding passes. We've deployed 60,000 devices to our uh, team within the airport, and you know, they're getting better at using this, these devices, but our interns are helping and teaching our <laughs> senior team, and our senior team is teaching some of those soft skills. And so it's a beautiful thing when that comes together like that. Um, but it's gotta be something that everybody comes along in the journey. So as we were introducing technology at United um, with these personal devices and being able to check in or deal with a um, upgrade right there in the moment, you don't have to be behind a desk anymore, um, having our team help us design what it is they want and how they could use it, that's how we got the ado adoption. And it's much better today than it was three years ago, and it'll be much better three years from now. So we're excited about that partnership with our interns. All right. Um, we've got a, I want to sort of come to the uh, a case study that's very fr um, front of mind at the moment. Yeah. When we talk about 
cities creating jobs, we often think about that traditional kind of competition for the big employer that's going to move, move its headquarters uh, somewhere. And the live one at the moment is, is Amazon, uh, looking for a second headquarters. You're on the short list of 20. Um, how did you go about that pitch? Um, uh, traditionally, it would be the economic incentives, it, could, it would be the tax breaks, it would be the sweeteners. Um, I, I saw a letter you wrote um, to Amazon talking about soul, uh, soul of the, the community in Austin. What, what's different this time? Well, at a really high level, uh, I don't think, my, my personal belief, without any inside information, uh, is that there's, uh, <laughs> Amazon's not going to make that decision based uh, primarily on what incentive is or is not offered by the community. Uh, I think they're going to be much more concerned, as are most employers, uh, with the environment that their employees are going to live in. Uh, and I think that the cities that uh, are able to attract businesses are going to be those cities uh, that have a quality of life that, that companies and, and their employees want to be, want to be a part of. So in, in, the, in the communication that I sent to, to Amazon, uh, I, uh, uh, first I obviously extolled the virtues of, of my magical community uh, and then expressed the belief that it would be uh, a place that Amazon employees would like to work and we have a lot of Amazon employees already working in Austin. But uh, I did point out to the company that we have two real significant challenges in our community. One is affordability and, and the other one is mobility. Uh, and express the belief that a company the size of, of Amazon might very well be able to help our city uh, meet or address those challenges uh, in ways that we cannot without that scale or could not for a, for a considerable period of time. So I invited uh, Amazon to join together in a conversation about uh, a different kind of paradigm for how large companies could enter cities to come into a city as a, as a, as a, as a, as a neighbor, as yep. a part of the community, also rolling up sleeves to, to help find answers to address what is that community's most significant challenge. And, and frankly, that is, that's the same pitch that I would give to any company uh, that was looking at coming to, to Austin. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think that fits with what is the spirit and soul of, of what is, uh, what's Austin. Okay. Um, when you have that inside information, I'm counting you on to tell the F, uh, counting on you to tell the FT first. But uh, we're going to go to um, questions from the audience. Um, we have got some microphones available, so just stick your hand up and uh, we will get a microphone to you over. Can we just go to this side here first? And then I see another one over there. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Guy. And could you just briefly introduce yourself and say who you'd like yes, to yes. answer the question? Okay, so I'm from Tel Aviv University, and my question could be answered by anyone. I want to return to the focus. Your focus was how to get jobs, how city could create jobs, or return people to employment after they lose their job. But one of the main concerns, and we talked about the gig economy, is working instability and staggering wages, things like that. And I was wondering whether you think that cities or metropolis policies can do something to combat these side effects of the current job market. I, I didn't. I didn't catch that very well. Can you just can you just try and summarize the question again um, okay. and just hold the microphone really close? Looking at the current uh, job market and the vulnerabilities that workers from all strata are facing, like job insecurity, like stagnating wages, okay. like low benefits, and I wonder, do you think there is anything that cities can do about? this kind of um, side effect of the current uh, job market? I, I think that you know, the mayor could probably answer better, but I mean, some of the policy opportunities for cities are around minimum wage and around earned income tax credits and things like that that could uh, make work pay, in essence. And I'm not clear. I'm not sure I heard the question. Do you have other policy about general For the most vulnerable. Yes, and, and you know, I think that the city, a city has to be concerned about that, especially now. And, and the questions of equity and access and opportunity are really the driving priority in our community right now because that's, that's where, where government involvement is, is most important. It doesn't necessarily happen on its own. 
So we have a city that's looking at uh, equity issues and access issues, training issues, making sure and education issues, making sure that uh, that, that healthcare uh, is, is equitably distributed in the city. And what we're focused on real specifically with job stability and job insecurity is making sure that we have training opportunities and, 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 and trying to create the environment and the, and the connections uh, with, uh, with the private sector, with the community college to help ensure that someone who, who, who loses a job or doesn't have a job. And, and as the secretary said, I think we're going to see that more and more as the technologies change, that there's an alternate pathway that there's a, there's a next step for someone to, to be able to find themselves uh, either back in an educational system uh, and try to create that opportunity or the ability to be able to retrain and retrain while you have children and while you have uh, families, but that those doors are open. It's also, I think, yep. business, business has to um, play a part in that. And while it's great to have a lot of companies come um, to your city, you want companies that are invested in your community and are interested in job retraining and things like that. So business plays a big role in that. Right, and I would just say that, that, that we started before the, 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 the Amazon uh, spotlight was turned on. We, we already had begun a process to retool how we thought about uh, incentives uh, so that they weren't just directed as co-investments to bring companies into town, but to also look at the opportunities that existed for small companies and businesses or large ones in our city already. We co-invested with them to, to create those expansions uh, that would be uh, homegrown. So we're re-looking and redoing how we do incentives to focus more on the community benefits that we want to have as the outcome of that interaction rather than just bringing in I think the only other thing I'd add that I've seen done really well in cities is, is actually having physical space um, uh, for the ecosystem, for professionals and for people in work to come and meet that isn't necessarily the office. So, you know, sometimes it's things like the Impact Hub or other times, uh, I know Google has a Google campus in London, but spaces where you're able to come and learn in informal environments and kind of have better places to network um, and to have those kind of soft skills because if you, if, you know, your job's not stable, you feel a lot better, a lot more secure if you're fully aware of the options that you have that might not be immediately obvious. Chicago created an organization called Skills for Chicago yep. Land's Future, which is an, is an intermediary that exists between uh, the uh, social service organizations that are identifying our most vulnerable and working with them on a day-to-day -day basis and the employers so that they could then help the individuals bridge their skills gaps, as well as often one of the challenges that people face is an ability to describe what they know how to do. Right. What are the skills that they actually have? I've been a production supervisor for 15 years. What does that mean I know how to do? That's a, that's a great point. Um, and I, I, I take back everything I said about the importance of city's geography and convening power uh, having diminished, but I think that location point is an important one. Um, there was a question over this side of the room, if we can get a microphone there. Yeah. Um, thank you all for your comments, um, my favorite panel so far. Um, in Tom Friedman's book this year, uh, thank you for being late, he says that the next generation won't be able to get a job, they'll have to reinvent this. Um, two questions here. Number one, how can educational institutions prepare the next generation for not just a specific job or a specific skill, but with skills and traits that they can reinvent themselves constantly over a 40, 50 year career? And then how do businesses adapt to the fact that millennials are job hoppers? How do you retain that talent when they have got so many options in Austin, in London, in Chicago? Thank you. Who wants to take that? Can I take hey. business? So in United's case, we offer flight benefits, so that seems to help a little bit with our turnover. <laughs> um, but it's really about um, being able to um, recognize that they're, they're really a um, agile workforce. They want something new, they want something different. And so you as a company um, need to be able to um, allow them to grow with you. So just like our interns, you know, you can be working in IT one day, you can be working in facilities the next day, and procurement the next day, um, next, not next day, but your career can progress through that and you can build the skills, like Penny was saying, through Skills Chicago on a different, in a different way, 
um, to keep them engaged, to keep them active. And so I think that that's something that business, um, that's what we do at United, making sure that there's different opportunities and continually challenging them, not just within their single vertical. I don't think from the city's perspective, there's anything we can do to, to, to help businesses maintain employees as vis-a-vis -vis other companies that are in our city. Uh, but I would point out that I think there's a lot of that happening in Austin. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of companies are coming to Austin, because there's an existing talent pool. And I understand that there is competition among companies that exist. But what we can do is try to help make sure that that talent pool stays in the city. And I can't emphasize enough in a conversation about business and jobs the importance uh, not only of training and their education, but just the culture of the, of the city, the values in the city. Dallas and Houston in my state are wonderful cities, uh, larger than Austin, dynamic growing cities, but they are both different than Austin. And I think that there's a, a workforce that selects to be in Austin as opposed to those other cities because of what our city is. Do we have another question at the moment? Uh, yes, just at this table here, if we can get a microphone. And again, do introduce I was going to add just something in quickly on that, on that last question oh. around how do, you, how, does the, how do you educate um, for that? And I think the core of it is to educate or allow people to, to understand and learn how they learn um, and make that part of the norm that you are continuously learning. You know, we, we joke about the university of life, but it is about uh, empowering people to not be ashamed or afraid of logging onto an online course, doing you know, a MOOC, for example, or finding it out, um, or joining any of these kind of um, groups that you have now popping up on meetups where people get together and learn a new skill or, or develop something um, or grow together. So I think that's pretty important. But in terms of companies, um, maybe not retaining, but knowing how to manage and, and build for that, I think the, the, the best thing you can do, as you said, is, is allow the millennials and young people to grow with you but also to stay in touch. So there's, there's a big power in you know, things like alumni communities where you know, if they've had a great time there at the beginning of their career, it's something that they won't forget in a hurry. And we're not heartless um, as millennials. You, know, you, you do want to grow and you do want to be able to expend your, expend your, your skills, talent, and maybe earn more money you know, and be more sufficient. Um, but if there's a company that's done right by you at the beginning, you'll do right by them you know, towards the end and always be open to opportunities that are coming up. Um, I do think that there's a, a little bit more in the evolution of kind of gig economy type yeah. um, contracts that we've got going. So I've, I've heard kind of maybe slightly more utopic, maybe not realistic um, ideas around, you know, how do you uh, divide up roles that exist already and kind of compartment, compartmentize them and kind of farm them out so that one person does a particular, almost like a job share, but en masse of, you know, a pool of young people who just want to dip in, do half an hour's worth of work and then come back out again. So I think that there's also elements of that, which, yeah. You know, um, practically, we don't know, I'm but it, it, you know, it's, it's being floated. Yeah, good. I'm keen to squeeze one more question because we're running short of time, but uh, I'll just go here. Great. My name is Jane Grover from the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. We all understand that this future of work will require continual job training, upgrading of one's skills, lifelong learning. But one of the bigger barriers and a source of anxiety as we look ahead to the future of work is the affordability of that training and education. There's an equity angle, an inclusive growth angle. How do we address that anxiety and the affordability of education and training from the perspective of those job seekers? Would you care to say that? You want to start? I was going to say policy-wise, um, this is something we've looked at quite a lot within uh, in, in the UK, and affordability of it is something that I think we've, we've looked to business more than anything. So a mixture of government and business. Uh, there are a number of different funds and grants available for companies at the moment who want to tap in and, and help uh, people that are already there retrain and, and work towards new roles or future roles. So that's something we're seeing a lot, um, but it's, it's almost to be taken as an investment for that company. So we also have it mandated that there's a certain percentage of salaries every year that are to be put to learning and development and learning and training for employees that you have that are currently with you. Um, so that's the model that we're, we're going towards. Um, frustratingly, not enough companies draw down on those funds at the moment, but I don't know if you want to... In the United States, there's really two opportunities. There are two bills in Congress right now, the Higher Education Bill and the Perkins Act, both of which would create greater flexibility for existing funds to support lifelong learning. And those are bills that ought to have bipartisan support. 
uh, and, and uh, frankly, ones we should focus on as business leaders because they would very much support the kind of lifelong learning that you're uh, 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 suggesting is important. The other issue is just the overall cost of, of um, education. We've got to make it easier for someone to access skills training along the way of their education so that they could be accumulating credentials over time as opposed to needing to just, not everyone's going to be able to afford to do four-year college straight away. And um, that would be another way to address affordability. Can I, we're, we're out of time, so, but I do want to ask you one uh, final sort of political question, Secretary Prisco, from your, from your perspective from your time in Washington. Um, uh, I saw another quote from you where you said, we owe the American people better information about yes. the subject, about the future of work. The political debate at a city level, at a, particularly at a national level, is often quite crude about the, the facts of the economy. It's very hung up on the jobs of the past, on defending uh, certain old forms of manufacturing or coal or whatever it may be. Do you have any confidence in a mature, uh, more honest uh, discussion with the American people, the British people, or any other um, um, group of voters uh, in the context we live in? I, I do. I think if we make transparency a priority as voters, I think that you can actually uh, make massive, you can have a significant impact. Uh, for example, this morning we were talking about we now have one uniform grading system for our public schools here in Chicago and one application process to all the public you know, K-12 schools, regardless if they're charter schools or what kind of you know, uh, contract schools or public schools. And what's happening is you're seeing people vote with their feet into the schools that they want to be in and making it clear where there needs to be improvement and where there's positive reaction. So I think transparency it, uh, is paying off, but it's something that we have to demand of our system, uh, of our business leaders, of our, uh, of our educational system, and of our cities in order for us to make the right investments. Because one thing that's clear, we do not have infinite resources. Okay. So if we've uh, got this wrong next year, we're all going to be replaced by algorithms. If we've got this right uh, next year, we'll have uh, one of Anne-Marie's uh, STEMETs and one of uh, Kate's <laughs> interns on the panel, I hope. But um, uh, for now, I can't thank our panelists enough. Thank you very much. Thank you.